Hey, so we're so glad that you're checking out this video and our prayer is that it helps those who are far from God become committed followers of Jesus Christ. However, what we don't want is for this video to be a replacement for church. It can't be a replacement for church. We believe that the gathering of believers in covenant community with other believers at the local church matters. And what's more is that God designed us to be in community with one another. That said, if you're in the North Georgia area and you don't have a church you call home, we'd love to have you come and visit Brainerd, North Georgia. I'm praying that this message serves as a blessing to you, that it helps you, encourages you, and even challenges you, all the while bringing you closer to Jesus. So again, super excited that you're checking out this video. Just don't treat this video as a replacement for church, and I think that the Lord will honor that and see your commitment to the local church. All righty. If you got a copy of God's Word, go ahead and turn to the book of Psalms, the book of Psalms, and we're going to be in Psalm 112 uh, this morning. Next week, we will pick up um, on our uh, series that we've been in for all of last year, and we'll be concluding it, which will be in the Gospel of Mark. Uh, and I'm really looking forward to us jumping back into the Gospel of Mark and finishing that out. But for these last two weekends, we've had an opportunity to be able to just kind of uh, sit in these two particular passages. We'll sit in it today, so to speak. I say that uh, in terms of reading through it and studying it, Psalm 112. And uh, we began last week in Psalm 111. And what I had mentioned to you guys is that these two particular Psalms are very much deeply connected. And the way that you see them connected is that the uh, author of these Psalms uh, made it a point to make sure to include the Hebrew alphabet that you see woven throughout uh, these two uh, particular psalms. And so they're very much connected. And what's interesting is that last week we saw a lot of the characteristics of God, three in particular, but we saw a lot of different things that made up those specific characteristics that God is an incredible creator, that God is an incredible provider, and that God is an incredible redeemer. And what's interesting is the more that the psalmist described uh, God in that particular way, the more that the psalmist was drawn to God, and what's more, uh, he wanted to worship and obey this God, the God that we know, right? The God that is revealed in the Bible as this incredible redeemer, provider, and creator. Well, what's interesting is the more that he continues to peer into this God, the more that he is changed because of his time spent knowing and understanding and reading more about this God. And so something happens. He is affected deeply by this God, so much so that his entire life begins to change. There isn't an area within the psalmist's life that is not touched because of the influence and because of the character of God. The person changed. So every aspect of his life is desired to live out in a way that that resembles the virtues of who God is. A God that is faithful, a God that is right, a God that is just, a God that is generous, a God that desires to seek even the flourishing of other people. This isn't a self-centered individual, but rather this was an outward-focused individual that desires to see the flourishing of other people. In other words, he cares about other people. He loves other people. All of these specific characteristics that you see now all of a sudden being modeled by the psalmist is directly because of the impact that God has made on his life. He exudes these virtues because of time spent with God. And so Psalm 112 exhausts itself to show how an individual lives out their life based on the influence of God within their life. In fact, if there was one singular point that we had to make from this passage, it's the very same point that I think you can find in last week's psalm because these two are connected, and it's this, that the works of God declare his character, right? And we saw that last week, and lead his people to worship and obey him. So as a result of what we saw last week, incredible creator, provider, redeemer, now this redeemer, this provider, this creator, this person is drawn to and they are completely changed and they want to worship and they want to live for this redeemer. The question is how? What does this look like? 
What are the characteristics of this individual? And what's more, what, what are these godly characteristics of this person that is deeply affected by God and his character as creator, provider, and redeemer? Well, that's what we're going to study this morning. So if you got a copy of God's word, just go ahead and be in Psalm 112. Let me read God's word over you and we'll dive into Psalm 112. Listen to the word of the Lord. It begins in a very similar fashion as Psalm 111. It begins with hallelujah or praise the Lord. In fact, it's bookended that way. It says, hallelujah, happy or blessed is the person who fears the Lord, taking great delight in his commands. His descendants will be powerful in the land. The generation of the upright will be blessed. Wealth and riches are in the house are in his house and his righteousness endures forever. Light shines in the darkness for the upright. He is gracious, compassionate and righteous. Good will come to the one who lends generously and conducts his business fairly. He will never be shaken. The righteous one will, re will be remembered forever. He will not fear bad news. His heart is confident, trusting in the Lord. His heart is assured. He will not fear. In the end, he will look and triumph on his foes. He distributes freely the poor, to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. His horn will be exalted in honor. And then verse 10 takes a turn. It says, the wicked, the wicked one will see it and be angry. He will gnash his teeth in despair. The desire of the wicked leads to warning, to ruin, excuse me. In that one verse, you see an incredible warning that the psalmist desires for all of us to know. And it builds because of what is being said in the verses before. But that's Psalm 112. Let's pray together. Father, we're thankful for your word this morning. We're thankful for the opportunity to be able to gather like we do and to hear your word. God, I pray that as we look to your word, as we study your word this morning, God, I pray that through the means of your word and the work of your spirit, that you would convict, that you would help, that you would encourage, that you would transform us. Help us to recognize that you have spoken. Help us to see your son in all of this. And even help me, God, as I convey your word. Fill me with your spirit. Use me as a vessel of yours this morning to convey the very truths of your word. God, we love you. We're thankful for you. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So there's two specific points that I want us to take a look at that I hope will help us see how the works of God declare his character and lead his people to worship and obey him. Here are the two truths. One of them is you're going to see the characteristics of godliness, okay, the characteristics of godliness. And secondly, you're going to see the tragedy of wickedness. So you see the characteristics of godliness, and then you see the tragedy of wickedness. So the very first portion, like I mentioned earlier, is going to be a study on what are the marks of a godly individual. What does a godly individual look like? And, and how does God interact with a godly individual? And the last portion, like I mentioned, is a warning. In many ways, it's a warning for us and even a warning for many who see, hopefully, what sin will do to them as a result of their desire to lean into their desires of sin and their desires to want evil. But we'll get to that here in a few moments. But the first portion should be hopefully a very encouraging one because we're going to see the godly characteristics that should be something that all of us should have or should strive to be able to do. So let's start with a few of them here. Here are the, the four, excuse me, five characteristics of godliness that I see. One of them is an individual who fears the Lord. The second one is someone who delights in obedience, as much as they delight also in the Lord. Third, you see someone who is seeking the flourishing of others. Fourthly, you see someone who is generous and just. And then fifth, you see how they have faith and confidence in God. 
and listen to me, this is the really neat part of that portion, is that this psalmist has faith and confidence in the Lord irrespective of the circumstances, whether they are good or whether they are bad. He has his faith and confidence in the Lord. But let's begin with this first characteristic. It is someone who fears the Lord. And that's what verse 1 opens up with. Not only is the psalmist praising God there in a spirit of saying, I have much to thank the Lord for. I have much to praise God for. So hallelujah. And then happy, another word for translating that is blessed. Or this one is an individual who is flourishing, right? So happy is the person. How does one become blessed or flourishes? Well, when they fear the Lord. In other words, the psalmist here brings up a term that many of us, if you've grown up in church, you understand it, this concept of the fear of the Lord. It's this reverential awe of who God is. And mind you, this psalm, as I mentioned before, is connected, right? So it, this doesn't somehow or another become ambiguous to the psalmist. The reason that he fears the Lord is exactly what we studied last week, that God is an incredible creator, provider, and redeemer. And so this psalmist is captivated by the God that he knows as those specific things, redeemer, creator, and provider. And so his posture is one of worship. His posture is one of reverential awe because of who God is. What's more is not only is he characterized by his fear of the Lord this posture of reverence, but the text also says that he takes great delight in his command. So the psalmist here not only is one who worships God in fear, but my goodness, he is also the same psalmist who equally delights in the God who writes his word. He delights specifically here what the text says in his commands. He, what's more is that he delights in obeying them. He wants to live out what God has said in his word. Now, all of us, I think, can understand the word delight. By definition, it means to take pleasure in something, right? Um, and to desire something. That's what delight means. Now, I don't know about you guys, but for us at the Lasso House, there's something that we delight in on a regular basis, and that is the crumble cookie. And I don't know if you guys delight in it the same way as we do, but we delight in the crumble cookie. And we always look on Sunday around 9 or 10 o'clock at night to see what drops for the week because we want to know what's going to be offered for crumble. I don't know if you guys are the same way, but I, I do that, right? And so you guys understand this idea of delighting in, right? What do you do? You lean into something, right? And I don't know about you, but last weekend we didn't get a chance to, to go to crumble because we were doing a lot of other things. But there was the snickerdoodle. There was the Twix. There was the childhood favorite cosmic brownie cookie. I don't know about you, but the cosmic brownie cookie. Did anybody have the cosmic brownie cookie? No one had the cosmic, a few of you. Was it any good? Hunter's like, bro, yes. Okay, good. Thank you, Hunter. Hopefully they'll bring it back. Any, anyway, needless to say, what happened? I, I take pains in some ways to stay up just to look. So does my wife. So do our friends. They, they want to know, they want to investigate what, what's, what's going to be in there right? What's going to drop this week? I hope the churro is coming back, right? Like that's what everybody's waiting for. And so in many ways, what happens? Our actions are followed by us investigating and by us wanting. We're almost salivating to find out what in the world is going to come out of a crumble, right? And that's exactly what the psalmist is talking about here. He's delighting. And so what, what does he do? He leans into God's word. It's not troublesome. It's not Duty, though all of us understand that as believers, our duty, our responsibility is to be in God's word, but that duty often leads to delight. And then all of a sudden, you, you incline your ear towards God's word. You want to know more, and you're like, man, this is good. And so the psalmist here not only loves the Lord and fears the Lord because of who he knows him to be, but he gets giddy about getting in God's word and the, the text even says he takes great delight, not meh delight, great delight in his commands. The word is the word that guides his life. It's the word that 
soothes his soul. It's the word that gives him wisdom. It's the word that, that causes him to have his eyes opened. I, mean, I don't know about you guys, but have you ever, have you ever been there before where you're, you're reading through the pages of God's word and you're like, just one more minute. I want one more minute, man. This is good. This is good. Where, where's that Jen Wilkins study? Because I need to read that quote again, right? Like that's where we're at when it comes to studying God's word. He's delighting. He's greatly delighting. In God's word. So those are two characters. He fears the Lord. He delights in obedience. Thirdly, he seeks the flourishing of others. So notice, this privatized faith is now in turn used for the good of others. It's not just kept to himself. He can't help but delight in God, fear God, and then allow others to be the benefactors of what God is changing in his life. Notice what verses 2 and 3 say. His descendants will be powerful in the land. The generation of the upright will be blessed. Wealth and riches are in his house, and his righteousness endures forever. So the immediate benefactors of this psalmist is his family. It says his descendants. And so what is going on here? The family is the immediate benefactors of his pursuit of God, his delight in God's word, his fear in God. And so his home is blessed because as we would understand this, well, there's a child, all of us, some of us that grew up in a Christian home, right? And we understand what it meant to grow up in a Christian home. I didn't have this. I didn't have this in my house growing up. We, we knew God, we knew things about God, but we didn't have devotions. We weren't disciple. I wasn't discipled. I don't, I don't say we. I don't have any siblings. I'm an only child. It was just me. We weren't, I wasn't discipled. I, I, didn't, I didn't have moments where I would, you know, ask my mom and my dad, hey, what are some things about God that, that, that you can teach me about? I didn't have any of that. Now, thank the Lord, things have greatly changed. And the Lord has had his goodness and his hand upon our home, and he's changed my mom. He's changed my dad. And for that, I am forever grateful for. But what the psalmist is talking about here is a home that is blessed because the psalmist here is seeing the benefits of what it means to invest within the home, godly things, righteousness. What's more is what you see here is an individual that is blessed with riches. God has had his hand upon this individual and they are doing well. But this person doesn't just simply keep those things to himself, but rather the text alludes to the fact that others are benefactors of this wealth. In other words, this is a person that has been greatly affected by God so much so that he's not hoarding his wealth, he's giving of his wealth. Not only is his family recipients of this wealth, but I wouldn't put it past this individual, that he is also a generous individual who gives towards others. How do I know this? Well, notice what verses 4 and 5 say. Here's a person that is deeply affected in every way. It's not just personally. It's not just at home. But now it affects his business ethic. Notice what is said in verses 4 and 5. It says, light shines in the darkness for the upright. And notice, notice the descriptions that, that is, is characterized about this individual. He is gracious, compassionate, and righteous. Good will come to the one who lends generously and conducts his business fairly. So you have a guy that fears the Lord, delights in obedience, seeks the flourishing of others, and also is generous and just. So not only do you see how he seeks the flourishing of even his own household, but now the psalmist here is described as even generous and compassionate. So his eyes are also are on those who may not have or are in need. What's more is that this guy wants to conduct the way that he works in a manner that is just. So not only is this individual characterized by running a clean ship, so to speak, conducting his business where there's integrity, there's honesty, 
there's goodness behind it. But he is also the kind of person that not only does his character affect the way that he does business, but what's implicit from this text equally as much as how he runs his business is how he treats others. So those who are under his managerial business are going to be treated with compassion, with generosity, and with justice. He wants to be fair. He wants to make sure that things are done right. Here's the kind of individual that is not going to sweep things under the rug as though they don't happen when, th when bad or wrong or wicked things happen. This person acts when something is wrong. This is beautiful about the psalmist. Here's a guy that wants to live in this kind of way. He thinks of others and it even affects his profession. So think, think about this. This is where all of us, this touches the light of every single one of us. All of us work. All of us have an opportunity to be able to be in a place where we're working. The question is, right when we see this here in this text, are we the kind of people that are working in such a way that the, the character of, uh, of, of our conduct, of, of how people know us to be, is a people that are filled with integrity, that are compassionate, that are generous, and that are just. Do we exude those kinds of virtues in the places that we work? And listen, isn't that, isn't that remarkably refreshing when you see it happen, when you see someone stand up for something that, that is right, even though everyone is pushing towards what is wrong, that all of a sudden you see somebody care for someone else who's overlooked in a workplace and they don't give them any attention, that they're loved upon, that people are thought of throughout the year in their workplace. That's, that's what this individual is talking about. Now, this is beautiful because what's incredible here is you, you see a man who has this reputation that is known this way. And what's, what's, what's really impressive about this is that the text seems to allude to the fact that the blessing that God has given him, the wealth that he has, the riches, I mean, it, it shows in the text, especially in verse 3, this guy's doing pretty good. But yet that has not affected him. In other words, individualism has not affected him where he hoards everything, but is willing to keep an open hand towards other people. And what's more is that materialism seems to have not gripped his heart. He's not in search of trying to somehow or another gather more for himself, but rather what God has done in his life has caused him to look very differently at what God has given him. He wants to use it and leverage it for the glory of God, not just for himself. If not, he would not be described as a generous, gracious, and compassionate, and just individual. In fact, the text even says that he lends generously. This is the kind of individual that he is going to give, not expecting something back in return. He's willing to be that compassionate. It's beautiful. Here you have a God-fearing individual, one who delights in obeying God, seeks the flourishing of other people, is generous and even just. And then notice Another layer of his character, it shows his faith and his confidence in God. Listen to be irrespective of what circumstances may come. So notice what is said in verse 6. It says, he will never be shaken. The righteous one will be remembered forever. That, I think, is alluding to his character, his reputation. Verse 7, he will not fear bad news. His heart is confident, trusting in the Lord. Why? His heart is assured he will not fear. Why? Because in the end, he will look in triumph on his foes. And then he'll do something here in just a moment, and I'll get to that. But, but this, is, this is incredible. It, it begs the answer. Paul, what's going on here? Why is it twice that the Bible points out that he is confident and that he is one who is assured. And then tied in the middle of it 
is this triumph over the foes. Most commentators, as they're looking at this particular section point, and especially Derek Kidner, which I love, he's such a great commentator and such a great um, theologian when it comes to the book of Psalms. He just does an incredible job. Derek Kidner is his name. But here he talks about the reality in which this psalmist lives in, and there's two of them. On the one hand, here's a man who has lived by principle, right? Here's a man who lives wanting and desiring to obey God. And as a result of his obedience and his fearfulness to the Lord, what has happened? His house is blessed. He has wealth. He has a job. He has all of these things, possession, a great reputation, you name it. So on the one hand, you see God's blessing upon his life. But the psalmist here does not live absent of another reality. He calls them foes. He talks about trusting. He talks about assuring. Why? Because he lives in a broken and in a sin-filled world. In other words, he's saying, God, if I get bad news, what bad news? If I lose everything, if my circumstances change, if my enemies do something to bring harm upon my family or upon even my business, where I go belly up, where I lose things. What does he say? He says, I will not fear, and I will put my confidence in who? In you. And then he also adds a line to this, where he recognizes that God, though I live righteously, though I live to be just and right before others. I seek out the flourishing of other people. I'm going to trust in you that when things may not go like I think they're going to go. And, And hear me, all of us are in this room, are old enough to know that we remember those days where we had a roadmap in our head and we're like, man, everything's going to turn out exactly like I thought, like I think it's going to turn out. And then years go by, you look back and you're like, yeah, okay. (laughs) <laughs> give life a little bit of time and you'll see that nothing always pans out like you think it does, right? Why? Because we live in a broken and a sin-filled world. And so he says here, God, when things are done even unjustly to me, even though I live just and I live righteously, I'm going to trust in the one who will triumph over those in the end. That though things may be okay now and they may change in the future, I still trust in who you are. And I still trust in the fact that one day you will be just in how you will handle things in this world. And so he is confident in all of this, which means, this is so cool, this is one of those instances that we we look at and we understand the reality that we live in. We live in a broken world where things aren't always going to turn out the way we think they are. And, And what's more is that This is a person who realizes that he shouldn't hold on to very tightly the things that he calls his possessions because they may be here one day and then they'll be gone the next. But yet his faith remains resolved. I love this. He fears none the less. And I love this because he's not giving himself towards his possessions. He's not giving himself to the things that he has. His, he began with saying that his source of delight and his fear is in God, not in the stuff that he gives him. This is, this is, this is what many commentators point back to. This is the perfect example of Job. You remember Job? And do you remember how there was this, what would look like, my goodness, this heavenly trial taking place. And God is present and proceeding over all things and even at that very moment and somebody decides to walk in after walking to and fro from the earth. Do you remember who it was? It was Satan, right? And what does he do? He begins to accuse Job. Oh, well, the only reason that that boy decides to love you and fear you is because you've given him a bunch of what? Stuff, material and wealth and all the rest of this. And then God says, 
go ahead and do whatever you want to him. And in a remarkable fashion, what does Job say when everything is ripped from him? His family, his possessions, his reputation. His own wife looks at him and says, you should curse God and die. And in all of that, what does it say? That he didn't sin a single time. And he said, naked I came into this world and naked I will live. God gives and he takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. That's what the psalmist is talking about in this section. Where Job's delight was not in the stuff that he had. It was in God. And it's that same fear that when it's that fear that is the source of your strength, your comfort, and your hope, all of life can be flipped upside down. You can get the worst news that you can get. And yet what happens? God remains the center of your life and he remains the hope of your life, the strength of your life, and the presence that you need in your life. What else can we hold on to when we cannot even know or understand or comprehend what's going to happen this year? Something greater has to attach itself to our hearts that defines our character. And it ought to be the people that say, I fear and delight in God irrespective of what happens in my life. And that is precisely what the psalmist is talking about. Stuff is good. Blessings are good. But y'all, God's better. God is infinitely better. And so there he says, I'm going to trust in you and my assurance is in no one else but in you. It's beautiful. In all of that, you see the characteristics of a godly individual. And then we get to the warning. Notice the tragedy of, the wicked, of, of wickedness. In verse 10, it says, the wicked one will see it, see what? This individual's life and be angry. He will gnash his teeth in despair. The desire of the wicked leads to ruin. Here, the psalmist brings upon the person who views the life of an individual who's going well, godly person, and begs the answer to the question, how will you respond in light of what you see? You can either respond in saying, I see what God is doing in that individual's life, and what's more, I see his character. I see what he hopes in and can change. Or, because we're broken and sinful people and our flesh is active, people can respond in another manner, in anger, in envy, in covetousness of what is present and say that what they have I want and they will go and they will take. And here the psalmist gives a warning. He says, careful how covetousness Careful how envy, jealousy, and desire, wrongly placed desire, what it will do to you. Not only will it consume your soul and cause you to do things like what the psalmist is describing here, to lash out in anger towards another individual because jealousy or covetousness has gripped the heart. It will ruin your soul. Why? Because it will cause you to do things towards others that you look back and, and discuss that and you say, my goodness, why did I do that? So you have this warning of saying, careful, because all of what I just described is what the psalmist says with one word. It will lead to ruin. It will lead to ruin. Not only in this life, but perhaps the, tra the most tragic one of all in the life to come. That's the greatest part of this ruin. How, listen, when you give your life over, to materialism, to envy, to jealousy, to covetousness, and it becomes your life. And you come to the end of your life. And all that consumed you were those things. Then it will lead to a Christless eternity in hell where there will be ruin for all of eternity. And it is a painful one. So in there is the warning. And you may say, good night. I hope and I pray that many will awaken to the reality of what sin will lead them to. Now, that's true. 
but it could also be true of us. We can be envious. We can be coveting. We can have a place where we look horizontally and we say, they have, they have, they this, they that, and then we want, or we try to keep up with others when we don't need to. And here, as much as we can say and we can look out with a warning and with a sober mind and this careful where sin leads you, follower of Jesus, careful where sin can lead you because equally as much, it could be a warning for all of us to say, are you content with the Lord and are you content with what he has given you? Is he enough and what he has provided enough? And what's more is, listen, what if the greatest blessing from God is not things that he gives to you, but the things that he withholds from you? Because they may be the very thing that can ruin you. And there is wisdom with what God does with all of that. That's the tragedy of what can happen, and that's the warning of what can take place. In all of this, you see both the character of godliness and the tragedy of wickedness, right? But what I love about our God is that all of these things are characters of who he is. And that he didn't stay away. He exemplified all of those characters. He showed us those characters and there was more. He sent Jesus so that we can perfectly see those character virtues in Jesus. And the reason that he had to come goes all the way back to the garden to the first Adam. The first Adam was delighting in God. And for a period, it was fearing in God. But then he chose to delight in something else, to become like God. And so what happened? He disobeyed. And what did the first Adam do? He ruined everything. So when Jesus came, he exemplified the better and the perfect second Adam who came and lived, was tempted, but yet refused, and lived a life of perfect righteousness, where the first Adam ruined everything. The second Adam made everything possible for us to be not only made right, but for all of the ruin that has come, the sin and the brokenness of this world, to one day be made new once again. We needed the second Adam to be ruined for us so that we would know in the future what it means to be made whole and perfect again. Just think of that for just a moment. Even though he didn't deserve it, he was made sin for us so that we could be made righteous and know what it means to be made new. And to that, my gosh, we give God incredible glory for it. That's why, as we've often, as the, man, if you ever read through the book of Hebrews, if you can summarize it under one word, it's even what Jen Wilkins discusses, Jesus is better. It's better, 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 better. He is the better Adam. He is the better everything that we need so that we can also be made better and whole. This is incredible. That is who our God is. He takes what is tragic and turns it into triumph. And we can one day wait for the final triumph that is to come. The psalmist here gives us, I think, a great encouragement to live out the virtues of godly characteristics while also holding in hand the warning that comes with sin. The psalmist here, I think, makes it a great point. God, beginning in, in, in Psalm 111, declares his incredible character. And through his character, it leads you and I to not only obey him, but to worship him for who he is. And guys, that's what Psalm 111 and 112 is all about. Let's pray together.